Our epistle reading today is found in the book of 2 Timothy, and we're going to be reading from the second chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7. The subheading for this is a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets tangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And then the gospel reading today is found in the book of Matthew. And we're going to be reading from the 12th chapter. And it's verses 33 through 37. The subheading is, A tree is known by the, its fruit. Would everybody stand for the reading of the gospel? Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And that's the reading of the gospel for today. Thank you, Dan. You may be seated, and we'll invite the kids to come up for Bible story time. Good morning. Today I'm going to tell you the story about King Joash. Eric, are you going to be kind? That's good. Cademan, give him some space. Now, King Joash was, his father had been the king, but his father was killed. And when his father was killed, his grandmother killed all of his brothers and sisters. That's not so great, is it? <laughs> This is not a happy family. Yeah. yeah. She wanted to be in charge. And so she killed all of his brothers and sisters. But Joash's aunt hid Joash. He was just a teeny little baby. And so he lived with his aunt for a little while. And his aunt was married to a priest named Jehoiada. And Jehoiada was a godly priest. He was a good man. But the grandma, her name was Athaliah. And she was evil. She worshipped idols. And she was mean, obviously. She killed her own grandchildren so that she could be in charge. Very bad idea. Now, when Joash got to be a little bit older, maybe he was six or seven years old, just like Linnea, <laughs> he got his, his uncle, Jehoiada, got together a bunch of people, and they got Joash to be king. They got all the people to decide that Joash would be the king, and Athaliah was killed because she had betrayed the kingdom and had murdered her grandchildren. She deserved the death penalty. And Joash became the king. And Joash was a good king as long as his uncle Jehoiada, the priest, was alive because Jehoiada gave him good advice, and he listened to the good advice, and he fixed the temple, and he cleaned things up, and it was much better. But after his uncle Jehoiada died, he didn't continue to do the right thing. He started to do the wrong thing. In fact, he killed his cousin, one of the sons of Jehoiada, because his cousin was giving him good advice, and he didn't want to listen to it. And his cousin said right before he died, you... you 
My father treated you well, and I have been faithful to you, but you're killing me, and this is not going to go well for you. And it's true. He didn't live a whole lot longer after that, after he had killed his cousin, and the rest of his reign, God was not blessing him the same way because he was no longer listening to God. The sermon today is a little bit about how people can change and how families can change, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. And it's something that we have to pay attention to, too. Should we listen to God even if there aren't people to give us good advice right next to us? Yes, Yes, we should. It's not easy to do, though. Let's pray. Can you fold your hands, Hawken? Dear Lord, we ask that you would give us people all our lives long who would give us good advice and teach us to follow you. And we pray, too, that in moments when we don't have somebody right there giving us good advice, that you would be with us and that you would guide us in the right way all the days of our life. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text for today is Ezekiel chapter 18, which I will read little by little as we go through what what the text is talking about. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The United States is known throughout the world for something called individualism. Is it not? (laughs) And we don't have to think very hard to see how, why that would be the case. (laughs) Why, why we would be known for being individualistic. And I, I would venture to say that in rural America, that's even more so than in urban areas. Uh, And that's a little bit of making a virtue out of necessity. When you live in the countryside, you have to take care of yourself. (laughs) You don't necessarily have people living 20 feet away from you or 50 feet away from you like you might in town or in the city. This individualism is sometimes, probably more than sometimes, blown into something that is very distorted and ugly. When when we think that we don't need help from anybody else, which is not true, if we think that we don't have any responsibilities to anybody else, which is also not true, we're no, no person is an island, right? We have to be connected to one another. And the Christian congregation is all about being connected to one another. However, there is something about the individualism, if you just want to use that word, that is indeed biblical. And that is one of the things that this chapter, Ezekiel 18, if you have your Bibles or if you want to grab a pew Bible, by all means open to Ezekiel 18 and read along. This is one of the things that this text is teaching us. I want to read verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Now, you have probably never heard the proverb, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the teeth of the sons are set on edge. Right? That's kind of weird. It's it's a little bit like our proverb, like father, like son, a little bit, except it's stronger than that in establishing a connection between father and son. What it's saying is the parents are this way and the children are inevitably going to experience this. There, there's no, it's, it's what in philosophy is called fatalism or Maybe we could call it stuckism. And we sometimes, even even though maybe none of you would adopt the philosophy of fatalism, 
there is sometimes in our heads a kind of an idea of stuckism. Like families are stuck being a certain way. Whether they're good, they're going to continue to be good, we think. Or if that family is bad, then that family is going to continue to be bad, we think. Maybe we, maybe we have an opinion about another place or another group of people and they've always been this way and we think that they're always going to continue to be that way. Or we look at an individual person and we say, that person has always been X. And we think it's impossible for them to change. And that kind of stuckism, <laughs> our text speaks against that. Our text today tells us that we shouldn't be thinking that way. And we'll get to why in just a little bit. The main truth that God is trying to teach in this text is found at the end of verse 4. The soul who sins shall die. And maybe you've heard that before. It's a very, it's a good one-liner, right? The soul that sins shall die. It's very easy to remember. It's very short. It's very pointed. That is what God is teaching his people in this text. And he is setting it up against this proverb that they had that was sort of a fatalism, a stuckism. The, the fathers have sinned and now the sons also are inevitably bound in their sin or bound in the consequences of it, whatever, whatever their thought was. God was trying to disconnect father and son a little bit, right, in their minds. They weren't stuck like these people thought they were. And so he talks in verses 5 through 9 about a righteous man and how his righteousness goes along with life. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. Here we have the outward description of a righteous man. And the Old Testament does this a lot. Sometimes it happens in the New Testament too, where we have a description of a righteous person in very concrete terms. We know from the rest of the scripture that we're justified by faith in Christ and that these righteous actions flow out of that. But here, God is speaking in very concrete terms. He's like, you look at this person over here, their life is in conformity with what I have revealed to you is right, they're going to live. Very straightforward. We have no fewer than 15 descriptions of this righteous person in these verses. And most of them are connected with a few of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal. That's, most of these descriptions fall into those commandments. So far, so good, right? And maybe the people of Israel would have agreed up to this point. He's describing a righteous person. He's going to live. Okay. But then we get to verses 10 through 13. If he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest and takes profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. What God is teaching us here is that we shouldn't get so stuck in thinking that one generation will inevitably follow the, net, the footsteps of the one before it. There is no guarantee that children will imitate the godly example of their parents. There is no guarantee. 
parents might do a better or worse job at raising their children, that is quite true. But that does not guarantee it one way or the other. And that's a very straightforward, this is just theology. And obviously, this tugs at our hearts a little bit. We might think about our children, whether they're walking with God or whether they're not walking with God. What God is saying here at the end, he has done all these abominations, he shall surely die, his blood shall be upon himself. It does not say his blood shall be upon his parents. It says his blood shall be upon himself. This is, shall we say, biblical individualism. Every individual person must stand before God the judge all by himself. Not with his parents or grandparents, not with his children or grandchildren, but only by himself. Now, we can be thankful for the rest of eternity that we can stand before the judgment seat also with Jesus, our brother, who intercedes on our behalf and whose blood has paid for the sin of the world. But like, like last week's text, Jeremiah 7 also taught us, you can't coast on the past. If your parents were godly people, that does not mean that you are guaranteed to be a godly person. If your parents were Christians, that does not mean you were a Christian. Every person has to be a Christian for himself. We continue then in verses 14 through 17. Now suppose this man, this is the wicked man now, fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress anyone, exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from iniquity, takes no interest or profit, obeys my rules and walks in my statutes, he shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. Now, this is the opposite thing, right? You had a godly son with an, a godly father with an ungodly son, and now there's this ungodly man with a godly son. What we learn here is that God can redeem the children of ungodly parents. And you, we can plug ourselves into this picture in lots of ways, right? You might think, my parents were ungodly. <laughs> is there hope for me? Yes, there absolutely is. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live, says verse 17. Or maybe, this is your grandchildren. Maybe you, you listening today, here or online, say, I'm trusting in Jesus. My children aren't. Is there any hope for my grandchildren? Our text says, yeah, there is. There is. Pray for them, dear friends. Right here, God says that the children of ungodly parents can be redeemed. So don't give up hope, but pray for them that the Lord would touch their hearts and call them back to himself. We have in Luke chapter 15 a few different parables, and one of them is the lost sheep, where there's 99 sheep that are all right where they're supposed to be, and then there's one sheep that's way out here, and the shepherd goes and finds it. Well, that shepherd is Jesus. And he might send you or me as his messengers to go and find lost sheep now and then. In fact, that's usually how he works. But ultimately, it isn't you or I who finds them, it's Jesus who finds them and carries them home again. So, in verses 18 through 20, we have a summary of this, shall we say, part A of our text. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he, sh he shall die for his iniquity. 
Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. Just like verse 4, we've got this one liner repeated again. This is what God is trying to communicate. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous person shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. This is biblical individualism. But there's one thing that needs to be clarified here, and that comes to us actually from the text of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. If you want to keep your finger in Ezekiel 18, you could flip to Exodus 20 and verse... Verses 3 through 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now listen here. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, how does that work? When, when God says in Exodus that he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children, and in Ezekiel 18, he says that, the, that he isn't going to visit the iniquity of an ungodly father on a righteous son. How do those things fit together? I have to give credit where credit is due. I... The following explanation is from Cyril of Alexandria, one of the church fathers from the 400s. And I found his explanation of this very helpful. What he said is, in Exodus 20, God is talking about families that continue in the sins of their fathers. So if you have a family that are totally ungodly and they go from bad to worse, eventually God is going to say, all right, that's enough and he'll put a stop to it. And we see God doing this with different dynasties in Israel. For example, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and God allowed him to reign, and God allowed his son to reign, but eventually their family was just awful, and there was nothing good coming out of the whole family, so God said, you guys are done. I'm going to get a different dynasty to rule in your place. And God does this sometimes with nations as well, where a nation will go from bad to worse and he will be patient with them. This third and fourth generation thing is actually God's patience. He's saying, I'm not going to strike you with lightning the moment a person sins. I'm going to be patient and give people time to repent. I'm even going to give you a few generations to repent. But if you don't, I'm eventually going to say, well, enough is enough. That's what is being discussed here in Exodus 20, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children. It's if the children continue and expand on the sins of their fathers, then God is eventually going to put a stop to it. It isn't to say that God is going to judge an ungodly father's sin on his godly son. We find that in the example of Josiah. When Josiah repented of the sins of his fathers, God said, I am not going to punish Judah in your days because you've humbled yourself before me. With that, we come to part B of our text. I want to read verses 21 through 23. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? What we had in the first part of our text is that families can change. You can be a different person than your parents were. What we have now in the second part of our text is individuals can change. You can be a different person than you used to be. 
as an individual. And God begins by saying that if you are evil right now, if you are not trusting in Jesus right now, it is not too late for you. It is not hopeless. And I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever thought about that and thought, well, there's no hope for me. God could never save me. But perhaps you've met people who have said that or thought that about themselves. I've done too much wrong. God would never forgive me. Or maybe a little bit different, but similar. I've tried really hard and I just can't seem to do enough. I don't think I'll be able to make it into heaven. There are people who have that attitude too. And what God says to people who are ungodly and unchristian right now, it is not too late for you. I can change you. Your life can be different. You can escape from death. And you can live forever. We're going to come back to that theme at the very end of our text as well. But I want to mention verse 23 again. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? We find this also in the New Testament where Jesus says, not Jesus, <laughs> where the epistles say, we've got it with Paul and with Peter, that God desires for everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is, this is God's heart and desire for every person. However wicked you might be, however wicked you might feel, God's desire for you is to live, to come and live. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. And whether, whether you, you think you're hopeless or whether you know that Jesus can forgive your sin, that line in verse 22 is worth being stuck in our minds. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. None. Dear friends, we have a lot of transgressions. And perhaps sometimes they haunt us. They're, they might be buried in a back closet or in the attic in our minds. But then out they come once in a while and they're not very pleasant to remember. And there are also ones that aren't even way back in the attic of our mind, but they're right in front of us. And bothering us every hour of every day. Dear friends, in Christ, none of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. The prophet Micah puts it this way, he casts all their sins into the depths of the sea. I've been told that a hundred years ago, when people had old threshing machines and stuff that they didn't want anymore, they'd haul it out on Cedar Lake in the wintertime when the ice was thick, and then when the ice melted, down it would go, all 80 or 90 feet, however deep it is in the middle there. Is anybody ever going to get those threshing machines back out? And Cedar Lake is not as deep as the ocean. Dear friends, our God has thrown our sins into the depths of the sea. But God also must warn us now in verse 24 where he says, but when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. This is the flip side. This is what is sometimes called falling away or apostasy in theological language. This is what happened, for example, to Joash, like I was talking with the kids about. He started out his reign well, and then he ended it poorly. And this is maybe where 
you and I need to pay a lot of attention because it can be easy for us, even if we're not coasting on the Christianity of our parents and grandparents, to coast on our own personal Christianity from yesterday or from decades ago and say, I know I was a Christian back then, so I must certainly be a Christian today. Dear friends, yesterday's manna will not fill your belly today. There's a reason that God gave the people of Israel manna every single day. We are that dependent on the Lord. We need him for every breath we take. We need his Holy Spirit for every day that we walk on this earth. Every day has its new temptations. Every day has its new challenges. Every day has... New opportunities to trust God, which are generally disguised as frustrations. The children of Israel praised God on the other side of the Red Sea and then immediately began complaining when something new went wrong. And then God would take care of that thing and they would complain again when something else went wrong. There is always reason for us to be watchful and to Ask God day after day, Lord, have mercy on me. To pray for his help in the fight against temptation. And to keep walking. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a very long walk. And it's tempting to say, well, I've made it and I can just rest now. When... The rest that, God's provide, that God provides us is the grave. And until we get there, we've got to keep walking with the Holy Spirit. Verses 25 through 29 discuss then the justice of God. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? We've got to watch out for this sometimes, too, in case we might think that we are more just than God. We've been reading through the Bible together this year, and for many, reading through parts of the Old Testament for the first time has been kind of an eye-opening, even a shocking experience at times. There are things that God does, and ways that he judges people and nations that make us very uncomfortable, to put it mildly. (laughs) We dare not accuse God of being unjust. He is the just one, and it's our ideas that are crooked. And we need to straighten ourselves up next to his plumb line. There's much more that could be said on that subject, but we're going to conclude with verses 30 through 32, where God gives an invitation. He gives this invitation because we aren't stuck. We are not stuck, and that is why he gives this invitation. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. God wants everyone to live. One of the ways that is very common for people to accuse God of injustice is in consideration of the doctrine of hell. People will say that it is not fair for God to put people into a 
lake of fire for the rest of eternity. But God tells us here that that is absolutely not what he wants to do with any person. That is not what God wants to do with any person. He says, turn and live. He says, you are not stuck. If you used to be wicked yourself, or if your parents were wicked, you are not stuck. Turn and live. Because that's what I want. I want you to live. Dear friends, if you can imagine the people of Israel who thought they were stuck, who thought to themselves, my father was an idolater, so I'm stuck being an idolater. Or I used to be an idolater, and I'm stuck being an idolater. This is an invitation of God's grace. This is God saying, you are not stuck. However terrible a sinner you might have been, even this morning or yesterday, Verse 22, none of the transgressions he has committed shall be remembered against him. That is what Jesus offers to you and me. God longs to forgive and restore everyone here and everyone watching and everyone in the wide world. And perhaps that ought to be our last point of consideration. We've thought about ourselves. We've thought about our children and grandchildren. I want to think for one moment about the people in the wide world. There are a lot of people out there, are there not? And we might look at them, and we might not be especially interested in them turning and living. We might think that they're stuck. Look at what their family was like from generations past. Sometimes we're even tempted to do that with races of people. They're not stuck, dear friends. And if God's desire is that every one of them should turn and live, then that should be our desire also. We love because he first loved us. And he loved us so much that he threw all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, your word gives us much to consider, and we pray that it would sink into our hearts and then grow and bear fruit. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here or anyone watching that feels stuck, that you would draw them as the good shepherd picks up his lost sheep and carries them home. I pray for the children and grandchildren that we might have on our minds who may have wandered away from you. Lord, we ask that you would bring them home again. We know that you can. Your word says that nobody is stuck. And so we pray that you would indeed bring home those we love, those lost sheep for whom we cry out to you. And we pray, Lord, also for the world around us. Help us to look with your eyes on the people that we interact with and not to judge them based on their past or on their forefathers, but instead to look at them as individuals, and to see that they too can turn and live. Lord, make us your messengers to bring the good news about sins in the depths of the sea to people who don't know it yet. And we ask all this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our closing hymn number 288 and the ambassador, Take the Name of Jesus with you. <laughs>